Okay, hi folks, and welcome to this presentation. Um, and it's the title there is opening up higher education through a low cost MOOC model. I suppose the argument is that um, currently the, all the MOOCs that have been developed so far seem to be extremely expensive, and if it is so expensive, it's going to be hard difficult to develop all the free courses that are really needed out there. And this this slide here in particular I put up is that often in learning technology we tend to concentrate on quality of learning and on access to learning. But we really do need to realize that cost is an access issue. If something is produced and it's too expensive then that rules a lot of people out anyway. So it's very important for us to be thinking about controlling costs. OK, if we look at the four letters of MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, OK? Um, I could ask the question, and feel free to uh, type, in there, type in there your own opinion on this, and it may not agree with mine. But which of these words would you say is the most open for discussion? Okay, which one maybe is vague or open to interpretation? Any suggestions there? Um, I have to say that at the conference in Lausanne, open was one that did seem to mean a lot. Uh, uh, and open in one place would mean that, like the open university, means that you can get access to it. You don't have to live near it, but it, it doesn't mean a lot more than that. So open seems to the um, the MOOCs from uh, the likes of Coursera are open for anybody to uh, go on to to take the course, but the content can't be reused. There and there are even other restrictions, so it does remain to be seen with open. But when we talk about MOOC, in general, open has a fixed meaning, I would say, in regards to MOOC. and just means that you can come on the course for free. So even though the word open is open to discussion, uh, I think in terms of MOOCs, uh, it just means for free. Online, it's quite clear. And a course really, certainly in terms of MOOCs, a course seems to me a body of knowledge, which, in other words, a whole set of learning outcomes that are addressed and it starts at a certain time and finishes at a certain time. So I would argue that in terms of MOOCs, open, online and course are fairly well understood. But massive seems to be vague because when MOOCs started a couple of years ago, I would say that uh, I think the first, some of the first MOOCs had about 2,000 on them. And nobody heard about them. And then Coursera got in on this, and uh, uh, suddenly we were talking about 150,000 people. So people were beginning to have different meanings of the word massive. Now, we recently delivered a MOOC, and it had um, about 2,000 people registered for it. That's pretty big in, in our mind. But that doesn't seem massive compared to what's recently been considered to be massive. But I would suggest that these open online courses, and to be honest with you, I'd almost prefer if they dropped the M and just called them open online courses, they'll come in all sizes. Um, uh, so even small ones where two or three hundred taking it will be quite common. So, and, and I would also suggest that do we have to spend all this money? If a course is good, if you have an online course and it's good enough for 30 students, would that not be good enough for 3,000 students? If it's a good course, it's a good course. So you're teaching it to 30 students. Why not let another 3,000 students into eavesdrop on that course? Um, these courses, these MOOCs that are very expensive to produce, you'll notice that a lot of the money is in the production of video, and they're very high production values. So if I were to say to you, would the Khan Academy, the quality of the original Khan Academy videos have been considered to be of good enough quality for the MOOCs that are 
uh, making big waves at the moment, chances are they would have said, no, these are not high enough quality. Yet, um, those Khan Academy, those original Khan Academy v videos were extremely prop popular on YouTube. And there's lots of other videos on YouTube that are done at relatively low cost that are really popular. So this puts a question mark over the idea that high production values are required for something to be of good educational value. Feel free to type in any questions there as we go along, by the way. So, and even where it does have the high professional standards and uh, in uh, video production, it rain, remains to be seen if it's particularly sophisticated pedagogy. A lot of the MOOCs do produce very good quality videos, but it's pr fairly straightforward pedagogy, just, you know, talking at the top, asking some quiz questions, maybe having a bit of discussion. That's not that sophisticated and can be done quite cheaply once you strip out the uh, production costs. So despite the fact that these MOOCs, and these are the X MOOCs, the transmission MOOCs by Corsair and the like, that they're not particularly sophisticated pedagogy, people do learn. I've been on one and I've found it really good. But I think I would have found it just as good had the production values been lower. In our own course, where we had moderately high production values, people, this is a comment, I got exactly what I wanted from it and more, a most enjoyable and educational course because the content was sound, but not necessarily high production values. So that begs the question, why are these, and it has to be said, mostly large prestigious universities in Coursera and Udacity, why are they spending so much on their MOOCs? Well, MOOCs are a hot topic, as you've said, um, you've, as you said up there, and uh, Mina, and uh, they know they get a lot of attention, so a lot of people will be looking at it. So it is really a matter of reputation uh, that they're thinking about. Now, and I think they are more worried about reputation and quality of learning because the quality of learning could be achieved much lower production quality and by spending a lot less. But it might not look quite as slick, so they have to be careful about that, particularly now as there has been that hype and people are looking at these a lot. But when that hype dies down, it may be different. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at, say, we've been working on developing fairly simple, straightforward, but good quality online courses for the last 12 years so what a simple course might look like. It might be 12 bi-weekly one-hour lectures. That's what we do, about 12 weeks. Uh, we would ask the students to do other readings, listen to other recordings, find free materials out there on the web for them to use. Um, we might give them weekly quizzes. That's fairly straightforward, sort of an encouragement to keep up and to self-test themselves to see how they're getting on. We do this in Moodle, by the way, and it has all the tools we need. Uh, they would get support from their lecturer and from their fellow classmates uh, through the discussion forum. Uh, they might have two or three assignments in the 12 weeks, which they would submit and get feedback from the lecturer and they would have a final examination at the end. This is not rocket science and can be done. Any any lecturer that may have taught evening classes or taught can or use PowerPoint and can quite easily change move their course online by in that form there. It's not that difficult to do. Okay, and we reckon it's about six thousand euro it costs us to to deliver one of these online courses, and that includes the development, which is done by the lecturer. OK. Now, if we were to look for, say, uh, maybe a MOOC version of this, what, how might we change it? Well, we might take off, take out the personal tuition they might receive from the lecture, so might, they might be depending much more heavily on peer support from there. OK. Uh, we might not do live lectures. That's what we've been doing in the past. We might replace those by 15-minute recordings or 10-minute recordings. Probably do the trick. Okay. Uh, the assignments we give, 
really if the course has been given for free the lecturers may not be able to do that so we may be able to rejig those or redesign them so that they're assessed they assess each other and that's working quite well i mean it's not fully satisfactory but it's quite well and quite useful uh, now what we might do is take out the final examination because nobody is really going to uh, give go to the effort and cost of final examinations and it hasn't been done in Coursera or any of those um, uh, for no cost if it's been given for free so there'd be no final examination so we reckon we could easily do it for 6,000 or less to develop such a course particularly if the lecturer who was doing this was pretty you know pretty good with the technology able to capture what was on their screen record it and then publish it online uh, a lot of these things we've described up here are not that difficult to do so we should be able to do it for under six thousand euro and i'll, I'll say uh, folks that at the conference in lausanne i did meet one particular person who agreed with me and reckoned he can do it for five thousand euro so i think we're in a similar ballpark i met a few people who agreed that this could be done so and the other thing is, well, it still does cost money to develop. So what are we going to do about um, uh, sustaining or where is that money? How are we going to justify spending that money? So um, this is maybe a model for sustainability. So we pay some lectures to develop an open course. The content is described. OK, that course actually can be used by self-study by some people or they can deliver it as a MOOC. And really delivering it as a MOOC really is releasing that material week after week after week, and then uh, being there to monitor discussions as opposed to control them. The discussions are peer discussions, and they would monitor. OK, so both the MOOC and the self-study can be used by free learners. Fine. We're not making any money to cover our 6,000 yet. However, you now have a resource that can be used by lectures, say, on campuses or on several campuses of university, and that they can flip their classroom. They can get the students to listen to this MOOC on a weekly basis or to go through the self-study materials. They can flip the classroom, and then they can meet them in the classroom to do exercises and other work and reduce the amount of hours that needs to be allocated to students. It can be used with distance learners. Again, these are paying distance learners. The materials are available to them, but those distance learners would get other services as well that they would pay for possibly more personal tuition or more personal responses to queries. Also, the free learners might have access to examinations. This is what has now come out in with Coursera. I think it's called the signature track, where they can um, uh, take these uh, uh, take exam pay for to have examinations at the end, so that can generate a certain income. So we could say maybe we spend six thousand on this, not a lot of money, to deliver the MOOC to supervise the delivery of the MOOC. It might cost us three thousand euro. Okay, uh, we might have four hundred free learners. You see what I mean? We're not talking about massive here. We're talking about very moderate size, but they wouldn't be paying any money. Uh, in our campus-based saving, we might save a couple of thousand. Not nothing. Not not an awful lot. Maybe a few thousand. And our distance learners, we might save a few thousand as well. But the idea is that this goes towards uh, these costs here. So over a couple of years, or over a couple of uses, we m might be able to get back this money. We also could get in some profits. We'll say from from examinations for people who want to be certified but I don't imagine they're going to be huge but as you see here it's not a lot of expenses going out and it doesn't take a lot to justify it and remember that behind all this the one of the reasons for MOOCs is to do with reputation so if the MOOC is useful at all this is going to get your institution a good reputation so it's not that hard to justify uh, why bother well we did talk about 
access, it is important to improve access to education and to cut down on costs. So at least the free learners, even the ones that want to take examinations, have much reduced cost of education. Uh, we may actually, over time, be able to use these materials to get savings on in our paid courses in the delivery cost for our paid courses. Now, that can be used, I suppose, as profits, profits for the institution, or it can be used to drive down the cost of learning for paying learners. Uh, a lot of people would argue that a flipped classroom is a better model for teaching, so it can improve quality of learning and our reputation and the amount of people who get to see our courses and what we can do. So there are lots of good reasons for doing this. So to summarize, uh, by the way, I did mention in my uh, abstract that uh, competency, uh, competency based learning may play a big part in this. And you'll see that competency examinations are pointed out here. This, if we generate these courses and people are prepared to give examinations, the cost of learning will drop dramatically. And this may put a lot of, well, I suppose, cause a lot of migration away from regular classroom courses or regular distance learning courses to these free courses with competency examination and may have significant, uh, I suppose, disrupt disruptive impact on education. Anyway, to summarize, uh, cost is an access issue. Uh, simple courses can be quite effective, as the Khan Academy has proved to us, I think. Uh, despite a lot of people's skepticism about the Khan Academy, there is a huge amount of people out there who say the Khan Academy helped them get through their courses and helped them get through their examinations. So we know that simple solutions can be very effective. Uh, and simple MOOCs can be relatively cheap to produce if we don't go for high production values and worth doing. There are many benefits to doing it. So that's it. And uh, here's a little plug for the OER Universitas that we're a member of that's working on developing not MOOCs as such, but open courses that can be used for MOOCs. So if you have any questions now, it's just yourself, Mina, managed to get to the end. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to stop the recording here.